Take your Bible this evening, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, please. <coughs> We're going to read verses 7 through 14. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. Begin together in verse 7 and reading responsively until we end on verse number 14 of Philippians chapter 3. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 7 of Philippians chapter 3. Ready? But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. <clears throat> Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Let's finish with 14 also. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we're so grateful that we live in America and we have copies of the Word of God. Lord, uh, so many believers throughout this world will gather together and have gathered together today. And they didn't all have a Bible. They may have had one to share. They may not even have that. And so, Lord, we're so grateful that each of us <clears throat> if we want to, could have a copy of your word in our hands tonight. And I pray that your word would be authoritative in our lives this evening and we would uh, grasp the truth you have for us tonight. I pray, Lord, you're blessed us special now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer, and Lord, we come to the preaching of your word. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, that it still pleases you through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Father, we're asking you now to speak to our hearts again this evening. We're thankful, Lord, for the decisions made in the morning hour and for your blessing, the word of God, as it was taught this morning. But Lord, we need a fresh blessing tonight. And again, ask you to move in, and in amongst the, the rows and up and down these aisles. And Lord, I pray you'd speak to your people's heart as only you can do. Minister to us tonight. Spirit of God, be the teacher. Do what only you can do here this evening. And give us all a burning passion in our heart, as was the passion of the Apostle Paul, that we may know him. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our world, can you hear okay back there? Is it all right? So-so? Could use just a little bit more, Dean, if you can help me. Um, that I may know him. You know, our world constantly pushes knowledge. Constantly, I mean, whether it's scientific knowledge, technical knowledge, financial knowledge, medical knowledge, everybody's always pushing education. If we just know more, we'll be better. And the truth is, knowledge without the knowledge of God is not knowledge at all. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, all right? You have to have a knowledge of God first. And you know, Paul was very passionate about knowing something, and not just knowing something, but knowing someone. Now, remember when he was Saul and he was persecuting Christians, he was pretty passionate about that. Uh, he got a name made for himself because of his passion to go after Christians and to persecute those who were of this way, the Bible says, living this Christian life. And now that he's saved, he has a passion as well. But the passion isn't just to do for Christ. The passion isn't just to serve him, though he did. His passion, he says, is that I may know him. I want to know Jesus Christ. And I want you to know something. You'll never know God the Father unless you know God the Son. Uh, the only way you're going to get to know God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so you have to know the Son before you'll ever know the Father. And so he says in Philippians 3, in verse number 10, that I may know Him. That I may know Him. Notice, not about Him. Many will join in the pursuit of wanting to know about Christ. They'll want to know about His teachings. They'll want to know about His philosophies. They'll want to know about His example. They'll want to know about His followers. But Paul's saying, I'm not, I'm not about that. I'm about knowing Him. And knowing Him personally. Knowing Him intimately. The word know there is, is know by experience. Not, not knowing Him because of what others say about Him. Not knowing Him because of a sermon I hear about Him. Or not knowing Him because of some second-hand knowledge. But participating in my own experience knowing Him. First-hand knowledge. That's what he's talking about. That was his passion. That was his pursuit that he wanted. That I may know Him. Now... How can we know Him? Well, notice what Paul said. 
He breaks it down for us in verse number 10. He said, we can know Him, first of all, in the power of His resurrection. Now this is interesting. I don't know if you ever noticed it before in this verse, but did you notice the order of the verse? Did you notice He said, I want to know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. I don't know about you, but it seems like that it's in reverse order. It seems to me like the resurrection ought to be last. You have resurrection first and death last. You have just reverse of what you and I think it would be. But you see, the first thing you experience in your Christian life is resurrection power. That's how you got saved. That's how I got saved. It begins with resurrection power. You say, how is that possible? Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And when you meet Jesus Christ, there's a resurrection that takes place. What resurrection takes place in our life when, when you meet Jesus Christ? Our spirit comes alive. How's that happen? By Jesus Christ. He's the resurrection and the life. You never find Jesus conducting a funeral in the Bible. Because anytime Jesus came around a dead body, it came back to life. Uh, he is the life. I uh, say, oh, what did he do at Lazarus' grave? Lazarus came forth and he was alive. Well, what did he do with that late woman who was coming out with her only son and they were carrying the coffin? He touched the coffin and the guy got up and sat up. And uh, boy, that emptied that funeral out, I'm sure. Amen. It would mine. Amen. And so he's the resurrection and the life. It's the resurrection power that takes place. The same power that raised up Jesus from the dead is the same power that resurrects our spirit from the dead and gives us life. I believe, listen, the same power that God, when He breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul, that same breath of God comes into you and me when you're born again. And they were made alive in Jesus Christ. And now, hey, that resurrection power isn't just in us to save us, it's in us to help us live the Christian life. It's in us to help us to obey what God wants us to do. We're too weak to conquer daily sins and daily habits, the bad habits that we live. We're too weak to live holy unto God. What, how are we going to do it? We must draw on resurrection power. We have to draw on the power that rests within us in Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6 with me, would you please? We'll come back to Philippians 3. You can put a piece of paper in there or a bookmark if you want to. But Romans chapter 6. Every Christian ought to understand Romans 6 and Romans chapter 8. Those are two important chapters to understand as a believer. In Romans chapter 6, <clears throat> notice in verse number 11, where the Bible says, Likewise reckon, Paul must have been from the south, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice how you're alive unto God? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you cannot be alive to the things of God. You must have Him. Okay, And you're alive to the things of God through Jesus Christ. The 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 energy that you get for the Christian life comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from His power working in us. It comes from His resurrection power. That's why we're alive to the things of God. That's why we want to come to church. We talked about it in our 530 class. One of the hardest things you ever do is to get a lost person to come to church. Why? That's the last place they want to be. When you were unsaved and apart from Christ, that's the last place you wanted to come. Somebody said, let's go to church. You thought about anything else you could do except go to church. I mean, that's the most dullest, boringest place you ever be. And so nobody wants to go there. What makes you have a desire to come to church? You know what? That's God. It's God which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Listen, any, anything I have in me that wants to do what God wants me to do, that's God. Don't think, well, I'm pretty good. I want to be in church. I have nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with God. And I'm obeying what He wants. And listen, the power to overcome the flesh, the power to overcome temptation, the power to overcome the things of the world comes from Jesus Christ, the power of His resurrection. And that power is available in every one of us. In the early years, 
as a missionary in Africa, David Livingston expressed his willingness to serve. He says, I'm willing to go any direction provided it's forward. George Whitfield, the great evangelist, said, I'm never better than when I'm on a full stretch for God. That's resurrection power. That's relying on the energy the Holy Spirit gives. People who, who, who rely, listen, people who serve God in the energy of the flesh burn out. Did you hear me? They burn out. You have to live in the energy of the Spirit of God. People who live in the energy of the flesh, they'll get discouraged, they'll get despondent, they'll get critical, they'll get uh, uh, self they'll get all kinds of fault finding because they're in the flesh and they're doing it in their energy and not in God's energy. The, the, the resurrection power. Amy Carmichael served as a missionary in India for 55 years without one trip home. Never took a furlough. Never came home. How does she do that? She does that in the power of Jesus Christ. The power of his resurrection. The same power that raised up Jesus from the dead. The power that brought him back to life is in me and you. It's in us. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Most of you are familiar with verse number 20, are you not? Now in him that is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Boy, how many of you like that verse? How many believe God's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all we could ask or think? Amen? That's what it says, is it not? Are you there? Now in him that is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. But how's he going to do that? According to the power that works where? In us. See, there's no excuse for a Christian to say, I can't do that. I, I can never defeat this. I just can't get victory over this. No, 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 no. It's not can't. It's won't. The power is available in you. Resurrection power, my friend. The power of Christ is available for every Christian, not just to save us, but to sustain us, to give us victory over sin and self and stubborn habits and addictions. Rely on His power. Paul said, I want to know Him. How can I know Him? I must know the power of His resurrection. I must see, know His power working in my life and realize that power. But then secondly, look at Philippians 3 again, would you please? He says in verse number 10, Not only that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, but the fellowship of His sufferings. The fellowship of His sufferings. Oh, we all enjoy salvation. We all enjoy life in Christ. But here, we're called to partake of his sufferings. Someone said this, and you think about this, I think it's true. We share our joys with many, but our sorrows with an intimate few. We share our joys with many, but our sorrows with an intimate few. I wonder if you're willing to be one of the intimate few that will enjoy, that will partake in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's many who want to partake in the power of His resurrection and enjoy the blessings of being a Christian. There's very few that will partake in His sufferings. The suffering is not just the cruelties of life, but this suffering is because of an, an all-out allegiance to Jesus Christ. And you suffer because of it. It's staying in fellowship with Jesus Christ when you're misunderstood. It's staying in fellowship with Jesus Christ when you're the object of criticism and ridicule. It's staying in fellowship with Jesus Christ when the world thinks you're odd. A bit peculiar. You see, fellowship of His sufferings means I'm willing to bear reproach for His name's sake. I like the fellowship of his blessings. Can I say I, I like the fellowship of his sufferings? Would you pray that I want to know the fellowship of your sufferings? Would I pray that? Paul prayed that. Paul prayed that. You see, I cannot handle the fellowship of his sufferings 
if I don't have the power of his resurrection. So I've got to have the power of his resurrection first. Then I can handle and I can be prepared for the fellowship of his sufferings. Let me tell you about Polycarp. You ever heard of Polycarp? Polycarp was the pastor of the church in Smyrna. You read in Revelation, the church of Smyrna. Polycarp was a disciple of John, uh, the, the disciple John, who wrote the book of Revelation. Polycarp, when persecution broke out in Smyrna, most of, most of those churches, in, and if not all of the seven churches, are in, were in what's modern-day Turkey. And it's such a sad thing to know that these seven churches, Revelation, were scattered through Turkey, and now you can't hardly really find a church in Turkey that's Christian. They're all mosques. It's become a Muslim country. But here they was in Smyrna, and Christians are being persecuted, and many Christians were fed to the wild beast in the area. And, of course, the, 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 the godless and bloodthirsty crowd began to call for the leader, Polycarp. The authorities sent out a search party to find him. He'd been taken into hiding by some Christians, but the Romans tortured two young believers until they finally disclosed his location. And when the authorities' arrival was announced, there was still time to get Polycarp away, but he refused, saying, God's will be done. In one of the most touching instances of grace imaginable, Polycarp welcomed his captors as if they were friends. He talked with them and insisted they eat a meal with him. He made only one request before they would take him away. He asked if he, would, if he could pray for one hour. The soldiers listened to his prayer. Their hearts melted. And they gave him two hours to pray. They had second thoughts as well and were overheard asking each other why they were sent to arrest him. Other authorities also experienced a warm heart when Polycarp arrived and the proconsul tried to find a way to release him too. He said, just curse God and I'll let you go. Polycarp's reply was, for 86 years I have served him. He has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Again, the proconsul looked for a way out. He said, just do this, old man. Just swear by the spirit of the emperor and that will be sufficient. But Polycarp's reply was, if you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you don't know who I am. Hear it plainly. I am a Christian. More entreaties by the authorities and Polycarp stood firm. They threatened him with wild beasts and Polycarp's reply was, bring them forth. I would change my mind if it meant going from worst to best, but not to change from right to wrong. Proconsul threatened, I'll burn you alive. And Polycarp said, you threaten with fire that burns for an hour and is over, but judgment on the ungodly is forever. The fires did engulf him, but the witnesses noticed his faith and his joy. And they finished him off with a dagger, and he was buried for the cause of Christ on February 22nd, 155 A.D. The fellowship of his sufferings. And he went to the third part, which is being made conformable unto his death. So we have the power of his resurrection, we have the fellowship of his sufferings, but then conformable to his death. And I understand Christ came to earth to die. Don't, don't ever listen to someone who says, well, Jesus didn't know what he was doing or he wasn't sure why he was here. He knew exactly why he came. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He told, he told Pilate, you couldn't take my life. He says, I, take, I, I lay down my life and I have power to take it up again. It's all in his hands. And he knew that he came. But I don't think the death here is talking about physical death as much as it's talking about a death to self. A death to my old nature. A death to the flesh. It's the death Paul talked about when he said, I die daily. I die daily. And, I, and, and you want to know something? We all die hard. Nobody's flesh dies easy. Somebody, sometimes Christians, we, we think we're going to, I don't know how many times you tell somebody what they should do and what they need to do, and you know what, that, you know what I hear? Well, well, pastor, that's hard. 
Like, like the response will be, well, I wouldn't want you to do anything hard. Huh? <laughs> really? I mean, do, do we really think so? You think God's going to say, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't want you to do anything hard. Hmm? No, we all die hard. It's tough. We struggle frantically to keep the old man alive. And we're all that way. Go back to Romans 6 with me, will you please? Romans chapter 6. Notice verse number 6. Knowing this, that our old man... Now, when the Bible says old man, is that talking about your dad? No. It's talking about, talking about your old nature, isn't it? It's talking about the old flesh, okay? Our flesh, our old nature. Notice, knowing our old nature, our old man is crucified with him. Who's him? Christ. Crucified with him. What? That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So we see when Christ died on the cross, we see ourselves, I'm crucified with Christ. That's what Paul meant. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. He says, I, I'm dead. I'm dying to myself. And I have to, I have to die to myself every single day. And reckon myself, reckon myself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. And I have to uh, crucify myself every day. And listen, uh, you, you remember, I can't remember who was here and taught this, but I never forgot it, that, that you can't crucify yourself. You remember that? You talk about if you, can, if you somehow could get a nail started and you could pound one in, how are you going to get this one up there? You can't. Someone else has to crucify you. And, and, and when you look in here, I was thinking if it was here in Romans 6, when it talks about, and maybe it's not in here, maybe it's in Colossians, but it, I know there's a verse that says this. It says, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh. Uh, and, and we can, here it is, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, R verse number 13 says, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You know how you die? You die by letting the Holy Spirit nail you to the cross. Every day when you yield yourself to the Spirit and, and ask for His control, ask Him to nail your flesh to the cross. Nail what I want, what I think, what I feel, nail that to the cross. And I want to be, I want to die to self. And, and that's our position in Jesus Christ. So I'm dead and he lives through me. He lives through me and he lives through you. Are you willing to be conformable unto his death? Are you willing to die to self? Notice, this isn't something Paul had to do. It's something he wanted to do he desired to do all right i'll die to myself that's what it's got to be huh well maybe that's why we have such a hard time with the flesh huh i mean we die hard don't we huh flesh doesn't want to go and sometimes we, we 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 let him talk us out of it and maybe we just put the one nail in and we leave the other one loose i don't know it's easy to happen that I may know Him. That I may know Him. You know what keeps me from knowing Christ more than any other thing? Me. Me. One who gives you the most trouble of anybody in the world? Look in the mirror. Well, my wife, no. Well, my husband, no. Well, that preacher, no. You know what it is? Just look in the mirror. It's you. It's me. Do I want what I want? Do I go where I want to go? Do I do what I want to do? I talk the way I want to talk? 
Or do I renounce self? Do I die to self? Do I crucify the flesh and follow Christ? I can't do both. I cannot do both. Now notice what he said back in Philippians 3. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, when he talks about attaining, he's not talking about I might make it to the resurrection. What he's talking about is attaining unto or at the resurrection. Attaining is what he's talking about. Because notice verse 12, not as though I'd already attained. He's not saying not as though I've already been resurrected. He's not talking about that. He's talking about not as though I've already been rewarded. There's a reward he's looking for. There's a, there's a reward, an attainment, a prize that he's looking for. And notice what he keeps saying. He says, I'd count myself not to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hey, what's the prize? That I may know Him. Oh, not that I just know about Him and that He can save me and He can help me and He can empower me and He can do this for me, but that He does do this for me. And that I do know His power. And I do know the fellowship of His sufferings. And I am conformable to His death. I'm dying to myself. Why do I die to myself? Why am I willing to suffer for His namesake? Why do I want to know the power of His resurrection? Why? Because it will make me know Him. And that's what I want. That's what Paul wants. That's the prize. You get to know Jesus. They that are in the flesh, you don't get to know Him. The pinnacle of the Christian life live in the power of His resurrection, to partake in the fellowship of His suffering, to be conformed to His death, to die to self, by, then, by, then by first-hand experience, I get to know Him. Not, not what somebody tells me about Him. I get to know Him. I get to be intimate with Him. I get to have personal time with Him. There's nothing better than that. That's the pinnacle of the Christian life. When... Alan Redpath's two daughters were young. He heard his wife say, girls, go get your father for breakfast. The older of the two girls bounded up the steps, and by the time the youngest one made it up to the room where dad was, the big sister came out saying, I already told daddy breakfast is ready, and besides, I have all of daddy. The little sister took it pretty hard, and a tear began to run down her cheek. So her father picked her up and he sat her on his knee. She put her head on his shoulder, smiled big, and then said something profound. She looked at her little sister, she looked at her older sister and said, Well, you may have all of daddy, but daddy has all of me. You may have all of daddy, but daddy has all of me. That's really the goal of knowing Christ, is that he might have all of me. That he might have all of you. When you receive Christ your Savior, you get all of Christ there is. But it doesn't mean He has all of you. Will you let Him have all of you? Well, you'll say, I want to know Him. What is stopping you tonight from knowing Him? Why don't you move it out of the way? Why don't you bow your knee and say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want the passion of my heart to know you. Don't, don't, don't. What, if, what are you going to, you ever think about, what will we, what, what, what will you do when you're standing in heaven and you look over at the person next to you and say, what's your name? And he looks at you and says, Polycarp. I think I'll stand away from him. What's your name? Uh, Amy Carmichael. Think of how many people will be there. and What if they look at us and say, what did you do for Jesus? 
Well, you know, it was kind of hot in church on a Sunday night once and I sweated. Or it was cold in church and I, I froze. Is that, all, is that all we got? Well, I went three times a week. That I may know him. Does he have all of you? Will you, will you say I want to know? Not, not, not because of what other people tell me. I want to know it personally. The power of his resurrection. His, that, that power working in me and through me. Yes, I'm willing to be in that small group that will take the fellowship of his suffering. We share the joys with many, but the sufferings with very few. That's why the disciples, remember the book of Acts? They were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. They counted a real honor to suffer some for Jesus. And I'm willing to die to self. So many believers want to try to live for Jesus and live for self at the same time. We don't ever want to deny ourselves anything. Being made conformable unto his death and die daily. What's stopping you from knowing him? Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth this evening? Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you for the Apostle Paul and for having him pen these words in the book of Philippians. Allowing him to bear his heart and his passion to let us know that his passion was to know Christ and that our passion ought to be to know him. And the way we know him is through the power of his resurrection working in us, the fellowship of his sufferings and being made conformable to his death, dying daily to self crucifying the flesh, being dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God. Oh, Lord, make us dead to sin, dead to the things of the world, and make us alive unto God and the things of God. Let us know you. Make that our passion, that desire deep in each of our hearts. We might strive for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. How many folks tonight would say, Preacher, I want the passion of my heart to be to know Him. The Lord has dealt with my heart tonight. The Spirit of God has pricked my heart. I understand the pinnacle, the prize of the Christian life. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want it just to be all external stuff. I want to know Christ. I want to ask Him to, that I, I want to know Him. I want that power, resurrection power in my life. I'm willing, to part, I'm willing to partake. I'm willing to fellowship in His suffering. I'm willing to die to self. Die daily that I may know Him. I want Jesus to have all of me. It's the passion of my, it's going to be the passion of my heart, Pastor. The Lord has convicted me tonight. Pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Bow your knee to him tonight. Do business with the Lord. Draw nigh to him. He will draw nigh to you. Father, bless this invitation time. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, draw us near to you now this evening. Give us a passion to know you. Hear the prayer we make, and we'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist plays. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you? to Jesus That's right. I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender
Go ahead and be seated, if you would, please. Appreciate your attention this evening. We're glad to have Betty Mize coming tonight. Uh, Betty Betty Joe, is that right? Okay, Betty Joe Mize. And, uh, of course, this is Susan's mom. Betty got assurance of her salvation this morning. She knows that she's saved, but she had not been baptized since she's been saved. And so she wants to take care of that this evening and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. So that's great. Betty, congratulations to you. And uh, you follow Miss Wallace right downstairs, and she'll get you set. Uh, to be baptized this evening. Amen? Amen? That's good. Praise the Lord, Susan. Amen. All right. Brother Bob, take it from here, and we'll go get ready to baptize. Well, let's go to number 105 in your hymnal. 105, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. 105. Let's sing the first and last of this, all right? Rescue the perishing care. Duty demands it, strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer our Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. That's good. Well, let's do um, let's do 195. 195 down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to His name. 195. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was blood applied, glory to his name. 
come to this fountain, come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet, plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was applied, glory to his name. Amen, that's good. Well, let's go over 212, 212. We'll do two stanzas of this. I think. Two, one, two. When I saw the cleansing fountain, I will praise him, I will praise him. All right. When I saw the cleansing fountain, open wide for all my sins. This is Betty Jo Mines. And Betty Jo, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And the servant said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Amen. Well, let's go over to 272 together. 272, once I drifted out in sin, had no hope or joy within, but now I'm on the winning side. Amen? Amen. 272. Once I drifted out in sin, had no hope or joy within, and my soul was Then my Savior came along, and he showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the winning side. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on. No more will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. From that straight and narrow way, I was drifting every day out upon the water deep and wide.
Let's all stand as we sing that last together. I will never have a fear for my Lord, he's ever near. Let's sing that last together. I will never have a fear for my Lord is ever near and in him so often I good. Well, we'll pray and be dismissed here in a minute. I had an announcement. I just uh, remembered we were uh, actually going to put it in the bullets and ran out of room. Um, for the missions conference, we will be doing the parade again in the Arts, of Alley, Arts in the Alley Parade. And if you want to start uh, bringing candy in, you're welcome to any time between now and the uh, parade. We uh, like to give out the candy there and did a great job last year. We had um, had a great amount uh, so if you want to just uh, you see it on sale or whatever just start bringing in uh, no chocolates all right uh, no chocolate it gets kind of warm and uh, we'd like to not make a mess so if it can be uh, candy other than chocolate all right um, Tootsie Rolls are fine but no chocolate all right so if you can uh, just start thinking about that we'll probably put it in the bullets in the next couple weeks but uh, you can be thinking about that as we move along pastor Talk about bringing candy. Chocolate goes that last office on the left <laughs> down there. That's where that goes, amen. I'll take it with me to the gym. <laughs> All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. Thank you for our church family. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. For speaking to our hearts we sure needed you today and you came through in a big way yes. thank you lord for your goodness and your love for us we leave this place now tonight and we're realizing that we're a peculiar people and lord we should show forth the praises of him who have brought us out of darkness and we live in your marvelous light Amen. pray that we'll know you this week well, we'll leave this place and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, Saturday, we'll strive to know you. As we strive to draw nigh to you, draw nigh to us. And Lord, let us live in your power, know the fellowship of your sufferings, and be made conformable unto your death. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for Betty, for her decision to follow you in baptism, help her to live for you, help her to grow in her Christian walk. Thank you. You brought her up here to us and help us to be a good church family for her. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing it. Here we go. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere I go For it's a grand thing to be a soldier In his army here below It's the grandest thing to be a Christian It's the best thing I know God bless you, you're dismissed